harmless. <coughs> we at the Women's City Club are well aware that a strong and flexible public health infrastructure is the best defense against any disease outbreak, naturally or intentionally caused. Helping to keep it that way is a long time mission of ours, and certainly that has come to the forefront at this point. Maybe we'll get more money, Mark. We are fortunate this evening to have Dr. Marcelli <coughs> as our guest speaker. She is the Assistant Commissioner for Communicable Disease Program in the New York City Health Department. And we have asked her to discuss the central role of the Health Department in combating terrorism threats, its past plans, present activities, and future needs. She is well prepared to discuss this subject with us. She is one of the most respected and quoted experts on bioterrorism and other emerging diseases, such as West Nile, which is probably the story at this particular point. Her daily bulletins on the anthrax outbreak not only guide health agencies in the city, but in the entire surrounding area as well. We congratulate her on her effective efforts and look to her for guidance on the role that we at the club might play on this essential issue. Thanks for this very sweet uh, introduction. Uh, can you see this okay, or do we need to turn the lights down? Here comes our lights turned on, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about our bioterrorism preparedness from the, I'm going to talk about the past, the future, and then the present. What I thought I'd do is sort of talk generally at first and then end by sort of summarizing uh, the past couple weeks, um, sort of to give an example of how this past planning was put into effect. Um, and I guess questions are at the end. So I tend to talk fast, so just let me know if uh, I need to slow down. Um, this is just a general slide, and it sounds like this audience doesn't need this reminder, um, but this is just sort of the general objectives of uh, any public health agency. Obviously, preventing epidemics is and outbreaks and the spread of disease is what most people think of when they think of uh, public health. Um, we actually have a very large environmental health uh, section at the health department, one that deals with injuries. Um, we just recently, with the uh, a referendum on the uh, uh, recent uh, ballot, uh, got merged more formally with our mental health partners. Um, we've become more and more involved in responding to any city-wide disaster, which isn't something that traditionally was our role. A lot of people at the health department really didn't think of ourselves as a 24-7 agency, but over the past several years, we've really become that, and it's really been a change in culture uh, down at the health department. Um, and then we have some role, they're less so than the state, as far as assuring the quality and accessibility of health services. Um, obviously, the, the recent events, we've been preparing for bioterrorism for several years, but I must admit that in all of our planning, which was really preparing for sort of a, a covert release in a large uh, area where people, many people would be exposed, we really, we really hadn't thought in great detail about uh, how the recent events unfolded. Um, but um, despite that, um, I think some of our preparedness planning did come in handy. Um, there's, uh, I've been giving talks on bioterrorism since, I've been at the health department since 92, but officially in this position since 94, and in 95, right after a, uh, the plague outbreak in India, um, we began thinking more uh, proactively about any large infectious disease uh, issue in the city and how we would respond, and that included bioterrorism. Um, and I've been giving talks such as this for several years, but in the beginning I almost had to force this talk, especially on medical audiences, um, because when you think of all the pu real public health issues we have to deal with every day, antibiotic resistance, hepatitis, um, the list is long, of all the real public health problems, it's sort of, it was hard to justify uh, the time and resources that really needed to be spent to prepare for something like bioterrorism. And I think a lot, a lot of the skepticism, the reasons for it are listed here. One, um, up until recently, there weren't that many uh, examples of biologic agents being used as weapons. Um, the thought of them, I think this is still true, is morally repugnant. Um, there was some thought, and I think this is still true as far as a large-scale event, that to release an agent like anthrax or smallpox um, on a large scale and affect a, a large proportion of the population is technologically difficult. The challenge in, in creating a particle size small enough to breathe in and disseminating it in a way that can cause a large outbreak, fortunately, is probably the biggest obstacle um, to a successful bioterrorist attack. 
And I think for many, just thinking about it was so painful. Um, it was easier just not to than to have to deal with it. Um, but the truth is there are a number of examples. I'm not going to go into any detail, but just to make the point that this isn't our first bioterrorist event. Uh, some of the examples go way back in history. Um, the first one listed was uh, during the time of uh, the Black Death or the plague outbreaks when there was a battle occurring between the Tartar army and the walled city of Kaffa. And the Tartar army actually wasn't doing so well, um, and their own soldiers were starting to die of plague. And they decided to uh, use that to their advantage and took their own soldiers and catapulted their bodies over the city walls, causing a plague outbreak in the walled city of Kaffa um, that affected their ability to defend themselves, and, and the Tartar army won the battle. So that's more bio-warfare than bioterrorism. Um, a more recent example here in the United States that actually did not get much attention until several years later was an outbreak in a small town in Oregon um, that was uh, perpetrated by members of a, a religious cult that lived in town that was trying to influence a local election. And they actually contaminated a number of salad bars in the city with salmonella. And at an estimated 800 people became ill because of this. So that actually still is uh, the largest bioterrorist event in this country. I think I'll skip the others for the sake of time. Um, I'm sure many of you, uh, with all the attention to this issue recently, have uh, seen that we in the United States actually used to have a very active offensive program that was stopped in 1969 uh, to President Nixon's credit. He decided that the use of these weapons was so morally uh, reprehensible that unilaterally he disbanded our program, even though the Soviet program was still going on. Uh, the U.S. and a number of other countries lobbied hard at the United Nations to uh, put into effect something called the Biologic Weapons Convention, which is still in effect today, though obviously there's been concerns about uh, member nations who had signed it um, uh, continuing to produce weapons, one of which we now know was the former Soviet Union, who had a massive, massive program, especially in the 1970s, and this did not disband until 1992 with the fall um, of the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it was finally admitted to in 1992. And there's a book that was written by one of the defectors of that program, Ken Alabak, called Biohazard, um, which I, I wouldn't recommend it for bedtime reading, but you kind of fall asleep afterwards. But it's amazing how successful their program was and the, the large amount, tons of uh, weapon, uh, agents that they actually had successfully weaponized and were sort of ready to go until they dismantled their program. Um, this is just a list of um, uh, countries that are uh, known or thought to have uh, active bioweapons programs. So these would be state-sponsored programs. Obviously, the other concern is about the rogue terrorist or rogue terrorist group who may have access to that. And unfortunately, we have less intelligence about who has what. And I think one of the more concerning things on this slide is that the um, ATCC stands for the American Type Culture Collection. It's a company here in the United States that does provide primarily bacteria, some viruses, to researchers um, and laboratories as for um, investigation purposes. And they actually supply the seed stock for anthrax to the Iraqi program way back when. There's actually documentation of that um, way before we knew that they were actively working on it. Um, I should mention that um, uh, this is no longer as easy as it once was here in the United States after a gentleman named Larry Wayne Harris, you may remember that name, back in 1995 tried to purchase clay from this uh, company and it was so persistent about the fact that it wasn't there in time that somebody got suspicious fortunately and found out that he wasn't associated with any reliable research program um, and he actually was arrested for attempting to uh, purchase something that um, could be used as a terrorist weapon and because of that incident and how close he got the U.S. has much stricter regulations um, for purchasing things. Um, well. Uh, obviously, uh, um, the events of September 11th have really changed the perspective of um, almost everyone in this country about um, our, our vulnerability to terrorism in general. And with respect to bioterrorism, and especially since the uh, recent anthrax events, I think everyone recognized that the threat is obviously real. It's been successfully used, though luckily not, not in a large scale. Um, the concern that further attacks are possible, at least until they find the perpetrator of this, though obviously um, that's not going to prevent someone else from trying. Um, having witnessed the <coughs> success as far as the terrorism effect of um, the recent attacks, um, obviously there's concern with the escalation of the conflict overseas, especially now in the Middle East, that, they make us, that may make us more likely to experience another uh, bioterrorist event. And as was mentioned, um, there are real concerns about 
not just our ability to detect, but more so our ability to respond to a large event um, from both the medical and the public health preparedness, um, which I'll get to in just a few minutes. Um, obviously, um, why there, there are many types of weapons someone could use to terrorize us, and obviously none of us ever have thought about the use of airplanes and suicide missions as, as being one of those events. But as far as why someone might choose a biologic weapon over a conventional weapon, um, such as a chemical weapon or a bomb, um, some of the reasons are listed here. Um, if someone knows what they're doing, and again, this is the challenge that really re probably requires a state-sponsored program to have this sort of skill, there is the potential for disseminating an agent over a wide area, causing mass casual casualties, and depending on the agent, at relatively low cost. Um, I think the most amazing thing to me about the past six weeks is sort of the panic that ensued um, with just a few cases, and, and a large-scale event would obviously just be multiplied that many more times. And for biologic agents, um, because almost every, every infectious disease has an incubation period, the perpetrators can, one, protect themselves, because they know what they're working with, with either antibiotics or vaccine, and also the incubation period between when something's released and when people start getting ill allows them time to get far away. Um, there are hundreds, if not a thousand or so, different uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, or toxins that theoretically could be used as a weapon. Um, but most uh, government agencies, like the Centers for Disease Control or the military, when they think about what are the priority agents that we need to think about and prepare for, sort of prioritize based on some of these characteristics. Um, the first bullet is uh, unfortunately true for every uh, biologic agent, and has, uh, at least initially, I think less so now, but when we first started dealing with our partners in emergency management and uh, the fire police, other agencies that are more first responder agencies, I think the hardest thing for them to recognize is that there wouldn't be a scene for them to respond to. Um, unlike the Japanese subway attack a few years back, when something's released, if we weren't told about it, there's no way that we would know until people become ill, and that could be hours to days to weeks for some of the agents. So the ability to sort of respond to a scene with lights and sirens just isn't there. Um, some of these agents are theoretically inexpensive and relatively easy to produce. Again, the technologic challenge is aerosolizing them at the right size so that they can be breathed in all the way into the lung tissue. Larger sized particles will be filtered out by the hairs in our nose or the hairs lining our um, uh, trachea and bronchi. Um, some agents, not many of them, will survive in the environment, and that's true for anthrax. Most of the ones on the list I'll show you um, cause either a lethal or a disabling disease, so they have that um, aspect to them to increase the terror as far as when an outbreak occurs. Um, fortunately, very few of them have an issue as far as secondary ways of infection with person-to-person -person transmission, but the biggest concern here uh, is smallpox. And for some of the agents, there's either no effective treatment or prophylaxis, or it's in short supply, um, and that's currently the case with the smallpox vaccine. Um, this is a list of uh, the potential agents with, uh, for bacteria, anthrax is usually at the top of the list, for viruses, smallpox, and for toxins, botulism. Um, and just for the sake of sort of uh, making a point about what the issues would be in responding to a large-scale event, I'm just going to quickly focus on anthrax and smallpox. Um, this is what the anthrax bacteria looks like. And I just want to make the point that this is not an uncommon disease in many parts of the world. We do, even in the United States, have sporadic cases. But worldwide, the most common form of the disease the next slide, is the cutaneous form, um, which we did see here in New York City, um, which is, causes an ulcerative disease, uh, ulcer lesion that gets very black and necrotic in the center. Um, but with treatment, patients do very well. 